What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Collider Interviews YouTube channel. Perry Nemiroff here. So this should go without saying, but I'm very excited for this interview right now because I have the pleasure of talking with Jeffrey Reddick, who is the mastermind behind the Final Destination franchise, who is also here to support his brand new movie, which is due in theaters nationwide on August 4th. That is Till Death Do Us Part. Congratulations on both things and then some because you have accomplished way more beyond that as well. Thank you so much, Perry. I really appreciate you you all having me on. I I, I'm, I follow Collider, um, so I stalk you all all the time, so not to be creepy. But um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about um, everything, but especially our the new film, Till Death Do Us Part, which I just want to say is an indie film. Everybody knows we're on strike right now, and our whole production, I have my WGA uh, support pin on, but I'm also a member of SAG. So um, our whole production team supports a strike and hopes that the AMPTP comes back to the table to negotiate a fair deal so that we can all get back to making our independent films and our bigger films as well. So I am eagerly uh, awaiting that day. Both Guild and then some deserve fair payment in this industry. And I cannot every, emphasize that enough. When, everybody, everybody in this industry at all levels. Absolutely. Um, needs, needs to be fairly compensated and it hasn't happened in a long time. But that's one of the reasons I love working in indie films is, you know, like Till Death Do Us Part is because when you're doing an indie film, you kind of know that you don't have the budgets that you do for the big studio films. But I will say that I, this is my third collaboration uh, with Timothy Woodard Jr., um, our director, producer, um, along with, well, our third, my third work with him. Um, and he just is, he's a masterful so I, I love his filmmaking, first of all. He's one of these people that when he says, I'm going to make a film, I'm like, sure, okay, I'll talk to you in five years. And it's like, no, it's we're making it in like three months. So I got him into the horror genre. And this is a really fun action, kind of in the vein of Violent Night uh, kind of movie. I think as far as tonally with like a lot of humor, some over-the-top gore, but grounded in, in real characters. Um, so I think this is going to be a, a film that, that has kind of a wide appeal to people who want some action. Um, a lot of action, actually. Natalie Byrne, our producer and, and our, our, our lead is a phenomenal, she was a ballerina, um, which obviously means she knows how to, you know, train her body to do all kinds of crazy, uh, fighting things, but it also means she's tough as hell when <laughs> she, <laughs> she did all of her stunts. So, um. It's it was really fun to watch um, and on set and the producer side of me was nervous. Um, she's also a producer, so you know you kind of you know we, we, I didn't get any arguments with her about her doing her own stunts because I you know I try I trust her and I know that we keep everybody safe on set. But I'm like, are you sure we're going to do that? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> There are so many little things we have to get into right okay. now. I, I want to kind of like uh, pull back a little in terms of your work as a producer. I got a two part question in terms of what you pick to produce project wise. So first, more broadly, what signals to you that your own skills and expertise will benefit a particular project? But then on the other hand, when you read something like Till Death, what is it about that particular story that you think would have you know helped you grow as a producer and filmmaker as well? Yeah. Um, there are a couple of things. I mean, I, I will, I will say the project needs to speak to me on some level. Um, no, but usually it's genre stuff. Um, to be honest, um, because I, I'm very big on giving back um, to people, so I have produced a lot of just you know independent films that I know like filmmakers in Kentucky are doing or in in smaller states. Um, I've had to kind of step back from doing some of that because um, I, I I was doing that a lot. And um, so now I have to focus more on the, the quality of the, the project itself is also, you know, because, I you know, you want to give back, but I, I just can't put my name on everything that somebody sends me <laughs> and and produce it for them. Um, but I, I again, it's just my, in my heart about supporting independent filmmakers. But with Timothy, we have I love our story because he was like hitting me up online a lot. And I just, that happens a lot. And he's like, you know, would you be interested? Do you have anything? And I was like, no, no, I'm, you know, Gil, you know, I can't really. And <laughs> he's so persistent. That's what I love about him. And so finally he sent me some clips of his work and then I checked it out. I'm like, holy crap, this guy's like really good. Uh, so I met him for lunch uh, with my writing partners on The Final Wish, which was the, a horror film 
uh, the first one we produced together. And literally like two minutes in, I mean, I was kind of sold on him going into the room, but just talking to him and hearing how passionate he was and the vision he had in his head. And um, so with Timothy, if Timothy wants me to produce something, I'm just like, yes, because um, I know the I know because I know the quality is going to be good. And I know that he is he makes his stuff like it's just, you know, it's crazy because a lot of times it takes 10, 15 years to get something made in this business. And when Timothy is like when he says he's going to make something, he makes it um, and it turns out good. And, you know, this just happened to be a happy mixture of like like I said, Violet Night, kind of the blood and the action and stuff that I like, but it's got a, it's got a cool love story at the center of it. That's, you know, kind of a love that unfortunately outside forces are determined not to make happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, 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 but, but, you, but stories that I'm usually drawn to have some kind of universal appeal to them. And, and when I did read this, I was, I did love the fact that, you know, it was about two people who were in love and wanted to be together, but, outside forces are like you can't and you know unfortunately bloody mayhem ensues so um <laughs> i mean unfortunately but fortunately for the viewer oh, for you, yeah. yes, it, the audience we need that <laughs> this movie is, is like top to bottom ambitious set piece one after the next so yeah. you sign on to produce you read the script is there any particular scene that you kind of circle on the shooting schedule and say to yourself my god we are going to have our work cut out for us on that particular day but then i want to know ultimately was that indeed the toughest scene or did something else catch you all by surprise there wasn't, a, there weren't a lot of, cause again, I've worked with Timothy so much. Like I, I know that he's going to pull off stuff. Um, it's always an ambitious shoot with, with, with the projects that we work on because we don't have the luxury of like, you know, 40, 50 shooting days, 30, sh sometimes not even 30 shooting days. So, it, he, but he's always got an ambitious vision in his mind and he, and he always gets to pull it off. Um, some of the scenes, like there's just so much fighting in it. Like, you know, I'm like, there's a lot of set pieces that I'm not, you know, I hope we don't have to like shorten these fights, you know, and make them really quick just because we don't have time to shoot them. And we didn't. And that was because again, Tim knew what he wanted, <laughs> Natalie, and we hired, we hired several stunt people to play some of the groomsmen, but a lot of the groomsmen were actors as well. Um, and yeah. And there, you know, the, the, the fight with um, Poncho Muller is one of my, my favorite scenes um, you know, just cause it's got humor in it. And Poncho came up with some couple of ideas for the scene that are, that are just fun. They're really funny and, but violent and, and he's such a good actor and such a good sport and, and Timothy kind of let them play. So, so I, I can't, I, there's, I'm never, because after working on two movies with Tim, um, like at the first film, I thought, Oh, there's, these scenes are going to take, be hard to pull off. And then we did the call and he came up with even crazier scenes that we pulled off with less time um, than we had, I think, on the final wish. And then on this one, we have a, a big cast and, you know, a lot of the stuff is centered, you know, around this hideaway for the for the bride. But we've got scenes on a cruise, you know, this kind of expensive yacht that's out at sea. Um, I know several people. I was not there for that day, not on purpose, but I know a lot of people got a, got sea, a little seasick, you know, because they're out they're out on sea. And this ship is like pitching. Um, I would say, I don't know. Tim would have to answer that question, but I think that might have been probably the toughest for them because when you're in control of everything, you can you can handle all the the variables. But I know on the you know, if your yacht tilts and things go flying um, and you're seasick, that's got to be a tough thing. I, I feel bad that I wasn't there for that because I feel like I should have been through that that seasick experience with the rest of the team that was involved. <laughs> the second you say seasick, I'm like, oh, like no filmmaking challenges, challenge sounds more challenging than having to deal with that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> you've you've brought up, you know, there's a bunch of extensive fight scenes in this movie. And also you do not have like a gigantic blockbuster sized uh, budget to pull them all off with. And it was making me wonder, can you maybe give us an example of of a specific uh, economical filmmaking tactic that one can use to pull off action scenes that maybe more productions out there would benefit from learning about and utilizing? Yeah. Well, I think part of making action scenes work is you have to care about the characters, first of all, like especially 
your protagonist, which is again is Natalie Byrne. So I think you have a lot of sympathy for her. And the fight scenes in our movie are are brutal because they're of the intensity of them. I mean, you know, you don't have to have people flying, you know, driving cars through walls and you know, in a lot of movies, especially because we're used to Marvel movies, it's like, you know, Iron Man can't just knock somebody into the air, into the ocean anymore. He's got to like fly them through 20 buildings that have to crumble, you know, like, so there's the spectacle of that. But when you, when you have a movie with a character that you care about and also, you know, uh, the groomsmen that are, that are, you know, her, her kind of main nemesis, um, when you have these fight scenes between people that know each other and they're they're brutal in their intensity and that, you know, there's no holding back, you know, obviously, you know, it's, there's something, that's why they have a lot of female horror leads as well. There's something about having a female in danger that gets us on a visceral level. And we certainly, you know, don't want to see a, a woman getting like beat with the crap beat out of her, but this is like a fight for survival movie. And so watching two human beings like pummel each other and kick each other and, in the ribs and like every hit counts, you know, and that that's also a mixture of sound effects, you know, stunt work, but also, you know, some of the, sometimes they were, they took a punch, you know? And so I think that that intensity, um, it doesn't have to be on a big scale. If it, if you're really feeling it, um, especially between characters that know each other. And also when it, if it's characters that love each other, but it's like this only one of us is the old, only one of us is getting out of here alive kind of situation the stakes of it are what make it really impactful. I think with, with action set pieces like that. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, it doesn't matter how big the punch is, as long as it feels visceral in the end, that's really all that matters. And you're like, Oh, and there's a, there's, again, there's a couple of kills that are just like, they're ah, like viscerally, but then it'll go, it'll go (laughs) next level over where it kind of makes it fun, you know? Um, not that it's fun murder. It's horrible murdering people in real life. I always have to clarify that when I talk about fun murdering people. Oh, with, but, with uh, every single project you work on, I imagine yeah, you have to discuss. Yeah, it. it's it, yeah. I do not condone murdering people or hurting people in real life. But I, you know, I love watching it in movies when it's done in a like one of the things I think Tim brings to this film and all of his films is there's a sense of humor to it, but not like goofball Three Stooges kind of humor. Like there's there's levity within the violence as well. Um, and you do get little, little breaks at certain points. And then there are points where you just don't get breaks where it's just like, you know, she is like going groomsman after groomsman after groomsman. And it's like, yeah, it's just that it's that intensity and that emotional connection. I think that, that, that filmmakers and a lot of them get it. Like you see a lot of independent films where they do a great job with this, where they realize it is the intensity within the scene. Um, and it's not about having, super big explosions happening behind your characters while they're fighting. I mean, yeah, it looks cool again for Marvel movies or fast X. Like if you want to have a car jump off a bridge and then ride down a dam and then fly, yeah, do all kinds of, you know, go into space or whatever. But <laughs> um, there's, I love that stuff too. It's crazy and fantastical, but this stuff is more grounded. And I think the more grounded set pieces, even like in a diehard movie, the first one especially was very, you know, they had effects, um, but it really was, you know, Bruce Willis taking on the people that were holding that build a, building hostage and um, trying to protect his wife. And that was that made every fight. It made the stakes behind the fight so important. And the stakes behind every fight in this movie are important. Absolutely. Um, All right. I'm going to remind everybody. Till Death Do Us Part is in theaters on August 4th. Now I'm going to do the thing that I specifically asked permission for. I wanted to make sure it was okay. I'm going to switch and highlight some of your work on the Final Destination film franchise, which, as I told you before we went, uh, not live, (laughs) but before we started recording, that franchise is near and dear to my heart. I credit it with being one of the big reasons why I work in this industry, in this capacity, why I'm a horror lover, first and foremost. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about with that one is I do, I know about the article that first inspired the Final Destination concept, but just to give our audience the lay of the land here, can you explain to them what that article was? Yeah, it was an article. I was flying home to Kentucky and I read an article about a woman who was on a flight and her, she was in Hawaii, I think. And her mom said, don't t- call her and said, don't take the flight you're on tomorrow. I have bad feeling about it. 
So she switched flights and the plane that she was supposed to be on uh, crashed. And so that put the idea in my head, um, which is interesting because what struck me about that is it, it made me think about premonitions in a way, but it also made me, cause I, cause I, I do believe that, that, you know, I do believe there are people out there that have gifts, you know, like whether it's psychic kind of gifts or whatever. Um, I have, I've never been able to levitate. I've tried it. Um, after reading X-Men, I tried it for many times and failed, but I do believe that people have kind of gifts and I do believe in fate, you know, like I, I know from a young age, my dream was to be in this business. And that was inspired that I love that Final Destination inspired you. Um, a indie film that inspired me was A Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, it actually, I credit that whole movie with my career, which is again, why I'm such a big supporter of, of indie filmmaking. But that movie got me in touch with Bob Shea, who ran New Line Cinema, which was like the biggest kind of independent film studio at the time. Nightmare made it a studio. <laughs> um, and I ended up working there and it was just, it was it was a termination on my end, but it was fate also that Bob responded to me when I was like this 14 year old kid from Kentucky who had no idea how the film business worked. And I pestered him until he read a prequel idea that I'd written for that film. And I worked there for 11 years. Um, and his assistant, Joy Mann, who isn't with us any longer was like, you know, like a godmother to me. I mean, she took me under her wings at 14. I would call her collect because I didn't know that was not a cool thing to do as a 14 year old in Kentucky. Um, and you know, that's why I think this, this industry, it's like, you know, I'm a huge genre fan, like 90% of the stuff I do is in, in the genre. I did work in animation. I started doing that in COVID, which I, which I love as well. Um, I just, cause I love writing, but, um, Oh, I saw your cat and I was waiting for my cat to come up behind me. I thought it was my cat. Cause it's right in the corner. I was like, is here. <laughs> this is Malcolm. <laughs> Hey, Malcolm. Um, my cat's named Damien. <laughs> Very appropriate. <laughs> He's a little devil. That's why. Um, so, yeah, you know, the final destination thing evolved. Um, and I love telling the story because people have this weird idea about how the industry works. And it, it was 10 years from the day that I graduated high school that I sold the treatment for final destination. But then I had to rework it so much um, before New Line even bought it. And then it got reworked a lot um, for the better. I love how the film turned out by James Wong and Glenn Morgan, who came on to write and direct it. And that's what people don't understand a lot of times about the business is it's so hard to even get a movie made, but there are so many steps that it takes to make it happen that it can not happen at any point. So, you know, writers only get paid if the movie gets made and goes in a profit. And luckily they did Final Destination through the Guild. If they hadn't have done it through the Guild, I would probably not have seen, I probably wouldn't have seen any money from it after the first one came out. And I wrote the story for the second one as well, um, uh, which was great, but it's a franchise that's near and dear to my heart, you know, as a horror fan, just, yeah, I, I'm rambling. I should let you ask your questions because I'm telling you all this. I would sit here and listen to like a whole oral history of <laughs> your entire experience along with this franchise. <laughs> I, I wanted to go straight to Final Destination 2 with that comment. But first, specifically with the first one, I am curious, can you highlight maybe uh, a particular actor who did something with what the role was on the page that just kind of blew your mind and that character became more than you ever could have answered? Anticipated. I mean, obviously, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but Devin Sawa, you know, playing Alex. Um, I intentionally wanted to have a final guy for that movie because I, I again, I wanted to turn just the convention on its head. And um, when I watched that performance, even today, I mean, when he throughout the movie, he's amazing. But that premonition scene and the way that he plays it and the fear that's that he has after he comes out of that premonition through the plane exploding spoiler alert if you haven't watched it shame on you um he is so good like he gives one of the i mean that performance rivals any performance i've seen in a horror movie and you know in horror movies a lot of times you know guys don't get to play that role at the you know we're we're at the beginning i mean he's he's nervous through up until the flight but his performance during the premonition scene and after just rivets me and I'm like, because there's just so many emotions that go through his face. Um, and he's, he's amazing throughout the film. It's one of my, 
I love all, uh, you know, my films, even the ones that didn't turn out so great. You find something to love about all your stuff. Cause I, I think you have to stay in gratitude or you just won't make it in this business, but Devin and I, and I'm friends with him to this day. And, and I, but I, I will go back and just watch that scene. I mean, I've seen the movie a gazillion times, but I will go back and watch that scene because his performance is so amazing. Like, like that performance in that scene is, is definitely my favorite makes me happy that you've watched it a million times. I feel like I've spoken to so many filmmakers who, like, I know you have to watch it a lot while you're actually working on the film, but so many after, like, okay, I've watched it that many times, and now I'm kind of stepping away from it. Well, I watch it. It's comfort food. I mean, I've been in the business for like 30, I know I don't like it, but for over 30 years. And so I watch it sometimes as comfort food, but then if I go to conventions or speak at school panels, sometimes I'll show it at schools. (laughs) Colleges, no, I don't want to. I, uh, Where are I those schools? Right Where are now. The I don't schools I could have gone to. There's <laughs> trouble. Yeah, I'll, again, only in college. But you know, so anytime I go anywhere, they want to show it. Of course, I'm going to say yes because if it weren't for the fans of the franchise, we wouldn't have a franchise. So, um, and we do. There is a sixth one that's planned. The minute, I mean, again, the AMPTP comes back to the table. That movie is ready to ready to go. So. Um, it's just really it's it's just nice as a genre fan to have something created that has become a part of the public zeitgeist. You know, it's just I, you know again I couldn't have asked for more. I am a big fan of the uh, the filmmakers you all recruited to direct that sixth film. As though I didn't have enough faith in that franchise, the two the two of them in particular. I'm like I know yeah. I know we're going to get another winner here. We're going to get a winner, and also I spoke to um, Guy Busick. He did this Scream reboot. And um, Stephanie is his writing partner. And they were so gracious because they, you know, they actually, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Craig Perry to this day. Like we're really tight. He produced it. And he's like, they called me. They wanted to talk to me about the first film and the second film about what I, what my thoughts were on what makes a Final Destination film. Like the kind of the key elements that are crucial to me. And um, it's just really nice because you don't get that a lot. Like I'm, I'm friends with, you know, Eric Bress from who wrote part two, like, you know, you, you become friends a lot of times with people just crossing paths. Um, and Eric who wrote part five is amazing, but it's, it's nice when the filmmakers actually call you and are like, you know, what's in, you know, we want to make sure that we get the essence of what's important to you and what you think makes this, these final destinations, what you found that connects with the fans. So they have gone into the story with the, you know, the best heart. And then, John Watt, who was behind the Spider-Man, you know, new movies came up with a story. So, I mean, I was just like, this is like the fucking A-team. <laughs> like, I am, I, I am just like, Craig will tell me stuff and, and I can't repeat it, obviously, um, because I'm very good at that because I know, I know I don't want to spoil anything. But, you know, every time that I've heard anything that's going, that they're doing or any scene that they're doing or planning, it just makes me smile. Like, the fans are going to be... It's going to be well worth the wait for the fan. I don't want to ask you to spoil anything, but I did want to ask you about one thing that I've read that you said in the past, that this new movie is not going to uh, follow the established formula. Like, roughly how much is it going to veer away from, from Death's design or maybe add another layer like the past films have? You know what? I think it's – when I say steer away, it's not going to – I love all the films, and I think that you can't get away from the – cheating death and death coming after you part of it. Cause that's what makes it a final destination film. And I think the Rube Goldberg device, which actually James Wong and Glenn Morgan came up with, I have to give them total props for that. Cause I'm in a huge nightmare on Elm street fan. And my original script was very nightmare on Elm street influenced reality bending kind of ways that death got to them. Um, but this film doesn't just kind of add another layer. Like usually there's a new layer every film where it's like, oh, well, this can save you or this can save you. This film dives into the film in such a unique way that it just, it takes it, it attacks it from a different angle. So you don't feel like, oh, there's an amazing setup. And then there's, there's going to be one wrinkle that can potentially save you all that you, you have to kind of make a moral choice about or do to, to solve it. So there's, there's a, expansion of the universe that um i'm being so careful there's <laughs> I expansion respect that. i respect that there's there's this expansion of the the world of final destination that i think fans are going to be 
really interested in and intrigued by it because it it does it it does, when I say it doesn't add a, a layer, it's not just hey, if you murder somebody in your place, you'll live. Um, there's a there's a it kind of unearths a whole like deep layer to the story that kind of yes makes it really really interesting this is a solid tease i'm here for any final destination movie, <laughs> but in particular after hearing something like that now i need to know how the mythology is going to grow i've kept yeah. you a few minutes too long so if you need well, to bolt i understand that's fine I, i'm fine <laughs> um yeah i'm i'm absolutely fine um i'll throw i'll throw a couple a couple more of my my fan obsessive questions at you right now because i know i know you've said in the past that final destination 2 went through less of an evolution from script to screen than final destination 1 did so it was making yeah. me wonder is there anything that you originally had planned for final destination 1 that you know got bumped out of that film but you were able to embrace more heavily when you were working on the story for the second film Nothing real, the, because again, I think the the biggest thing that changed for, for the film. This story is basically the same, but it, in my version, because again of my Nightmare on Elm Street influence, because death messed up the first time, it couldn't come back and just kill them again. So um, we never saw death, but it was very it would psychologically manipulate survivors' guilt or something that the kids had done um, to make them kill themselves in ways that looked like accidents, which is pretty heavy. Um, so I actually did recycle some of the death scenes from that script in my movie Tamara. Um, so I got to, I got to use the psychological, um, you know, kind of either sins of the kids or secrets of the kids being used to, to, to off them. I, I did, I did crib several scenes from that and put it in my movie Tamara. But once we got to Final Destination 2, I kind of knew what the, that the Rube Goldberg aspect was the way to go. Um, so when I came up with the story for that and the, you know, the opening with the log truck scene, um, you know, I got to, I just went with the Rube Goldberg aspect and a couple of things I wanted to do with the sequel that I love with sequels is I wanted to start off with, cause in the first movie, originally they, my treatment, they were all adults, but then scream came out and I love scream. Kevin Williams is a good friend of mine too. And, I love it too. Uh, and I'm not dropping names. I'm just saying when I talk about movies, it's like, you know, it's a tight community. So we, we all get to know each other um, over the years, uh, but we, they changed it to all teenagers. Um, so what I wanted to do with the second one was open up on a group of teenagers that you think are going to be, Oh, this is, these are going to be our teenagers that are the lead characters. And then, wipe most of them out <laughs> except for aj cook's character kimberly um in the first act and then we follow adults so i brought i got to carry that over into the sequel um and and i also wanted to expand the mythology so that you learn that the characters all their fates in the second movie were tied to the fates of the character in the first movie um that's why they were on that freeway that day um and i got to bring you know some original characters back i wanted to bring both Alex and Clearback. Um, there were some issues with scheduling and stuff with with getting Devin Sawa back, and I got annoyed how you know they just killed him off with a brick, which I thought was a big f you. Um, that's the only. That's really my only complaint with Final Destination Two. And to be honest, if I had them both back, I had always planned on killing Kimberly. I mean, yeah, I mean Clear, but I wanted to keep Alex alive. To you know, there I had a cool twist at the end where. It still was, you know, she has a life that saves her life. Um, but then death gets her once she has the has the, the kid and Alex is still kind of the torchbearer. That was my original take. But with the scheduling stuff, we ended up with no Alex. And I'm like, oh, if I didn't know we weren't going to bring Alex back, I would have not have killed Clear. Because I, I love bringing original people back, but I don't like killing them. <laughs> I very if much I, get that. Oh, I love I love the franchise so much as is, but like see hearing yeah. that like alt path they could have gone down is very curious to me. Can can I ask you, do you mind why you're not an executive producer on three, four, and five? Yeah, I, w I was an executive producer on the second one uh because they used my story really. And you know, I I was I was involved a lot behind the scenes on the first film because I worked at the studio. Uh, but I, you know, at that point I was, I was working at the studio till I sold the second movie. Um, and finally they were like, Jeffrey, we love you. You've been here 11 years. You have two studio films coming out now. You're a big boy writer. 
So you probably should go be a big boy writer and quit working here in our marketing and TV department. I'm like, okay. Um, so there, there's no real reason, honestly. I feel they, I mean, I'm, I still stay involved, especially through through Craig, but it is, and I, and I think it's partially because I worked at the studio for so long. I, there was definitely two things happened. I didn't move to LA after I sold the first one, which I should have done. You know, I, in hindsight, as a creative, I should have moved out here so I could take meetings and people would know me. Um, you know, James Wong and Glenn Morgan were out here. So they got, you know, we're taking all the meetings. And so by the time I moved out here, people were, you know, my agent's like, well, I know that you worked on the, the first two movies, but, you know, in Hollywood, it's like really the directors and the stars that get all the meetings. And so I kind of have to reintroduce you to the town. So I feel like there's this undercurrent at New Line, if I'm being honest, that I'm an employee that got lucky for them because I worked there for so long, as opposed to thinking, oh, wow, he's a screenwriter who created a big franchise for us. So again, it's that's the way the business, that's, you know, it's perception. I I don't get bitter because honestly, I feel like with, especially, you know, with the first two films, and the log truck scene in the second one, like both of those scenes came from me going home to Kentucky, came to me and the log truck scene is kind of probably the most iconic scene from the franchise. Um, as a horror fan, I'm, I always stay in gratitude about stuff, but I, I, it was funny I, when I was talking to Craig recently, I was like, you know what? Yeah, if we do, I know it's been 13 years um, since there's been a final next year. I, I believe think. it. <laughs> I know. So I did tell Craig this a lot when we were talking like the last time I was like, yeah, when, when you all do a next one, like, I, you know, I want to come in and talk to you because, you know, there was a point in me where I'm like, yeah, I'll let him come to me. I'll just keep doing, a, you know, I'll keep doing my 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 thing because I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I do feel like they brought in great people to do the sequels. So, again, like I'm not so precious about something where it like it has to be me or, you know, I, you know, um, you know, I, I love what Eric Bress and J. Mackey Gruber and David Ellis did with the the second one. And, you know, the yeah, I, I just like all of them. And I, I think they keep bringing in great people to do it. So I feel like it's like, you know, this is a baby that I put out in the world and other people are taking care of it now as it grows up. But, well, that sounds awful. Um, I feel like I put a baby in the world and then it turned... Um, it turned legal where it, and then other people are taking care of it. It's, yeah. Poor. Yeah. Give birth to a baby and just pass it around. That doesn't sound. I will <laughs> say though, regardless of the title, I feel like I know I could speak for myself, but it also does feel like I could speak for some of the final destination fan base that you are very clearly viewed as like the godfather of this franchise. And I feel like when it comes to the fan perspective, that that's what matters more than anything in the world. It, it does. And it, and it took a while, it took a while, you know, cause I, like I said, my agent said, when I came out here, he's like, we're going to have to kind of reintroduce you to the town. And I was like, but my name's all over the poster and it says my story and, you know, and I got a screenplay and he's like, yeah, but they, uh, you know, the business sees who walks through their door, you know, they don't look at the credits and things like that. So, um, so yes, it's absolutely, the fan base knows and, and Hollywood knows now it just took, it took some time. Um, but I'm, again, I'm just grateful because I, I've always said like, as a little kid, like that 14 year old kid in Hollywood or in Kentucky, if you'd have told him one day he would create a franchise that would, would be become, you know, it's, it's mentioned up there with like really amazing iconic franchises from that era and before and after, like, I would be like, oh, that would be sweet. And that's what I, that's what I'm like. I still want to do a couple more, you know, it's, you know, but yeah, that, if that's on my tombstone, I will be very happy. But I love, I love that I've expanded again into producing and directing. And, but the producing part is really fun because again, I get a chance to meet filmmakers like Timothy and work on, you know, horror films with him. Like again, he's, He'll, he, this isn't a horror film till death do his part. It's, it's action again in the vein of violent night, but more action, not as, not as horror, but I got him hooked on horror. So then it's like, all right, I got another one. So I can keep, 
you know, spread the horror love out I'm there. Spreading the horror love, and now he's a horror fan too. So <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a big fan <laughs> of that happening. I'll, so this this makes me think of. I'll end with this question here because speaking mm-hmm. of you know spreading the horror love, one of Final Destination's claim to fame is that many people out there won't do certain things anymore because of the kill scenes that happen in these movies. So is there yeah. any particular thing that happens in one of these films that has changed your own day to day? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, the only funny, cause I never liked log trucks. Like that's what I, you know, when, when I was trying to come up with the opening for the second one, I, I w- got behind one and then I just immediately pulled over. And then I was like, ah, crap. And then I pulled off the highway and called Craig and he's like, that's the opening. Cause we'd been trying to figure out, like, he didn't like some of the other openings that he's like, it's just not big enough. Um, but I will say, cause I, I I've never had a fear of flying, but I will say if I get on a plane and there's any turbulence, I won't freak out, but I'll be like, you know what? This will just be my luck <laughs> like <laughs> that this plane goes down and that's going to be like, it'll be great for marketing the oh, next no. one. <laughs> but, would, no. you, would you ever get on a flight if the number was 180? I think about this a lot and I think I probably oh, yeah. would just because I'd be uh, so curious. Like I would, feel, yeah. I would feel like it was fate that I was given a flight with that number and I'm yeah. so obsessed with this franchise. Yeah. That's how I would look at it as well. So, so I haven't, I haven't, nothing's been shown that I, that's made me afraid of something that I wasn't afraid of already. Like, like gymnastics, I would never do because I'd be afraid I'd fall off a bar and break my, you know, so, but so it's never, it hasn't, it hasn't traumatized me with anything, but I think that's being a horror fan and knowing that, you know, behind the scenes that these movies are what you see on the screen, like when you, sh- when you're shooting it. Like the fight scenes until death do his part. Like what you see on the screen, great. But there were also, you know, people like right off camera with with lights and you know, and and sound people. And when you have like romantic or sexual scenes in films, yeah, it looks sexy on screen. But you, if you were to pull back, you'd see, you know, light and grit people like holding their cameras, like yawning. <laughs> like how many takes is this? So. Uh, so yeah, I haven't I haven't really I do think the gymnastic scene in the fifth one was the scene that um shocked me the most where I actually yelled out during this during the screening the early screening of it. I was kind of embarrassed because I'm so used to these movies that the way that that scene ended, I was like, ah like it really it, it I give major props to everybody involved in that fifth one because that that scene actually did make me scream out loud in a theater i feel like that's the ultimate achievement to get you of all people to actually (laughs) scream out loud with one of those i could i could seriously keep you here all day talking about this particular franchise i will say congratulations on that and and all of the the horror that you have infused this world with because as weird as it sounds the horror you have created makes me happy but also congratulations on what you're doing as a producer in terms of uh you know supporting independent cinema within the genre and then also really pumping up emerging voices in this space because if people like you don't do that there's so many wonderful horror filmmakers out there that would not get the time in the spotlight they deserve. So thank you and congratulations yeah. on all of that. Thank you so much. It was great talking with you. And um, yeah, we can always come back and talk about, <laughs> have a gabathon on Final Destination, but but everybody should go out. Yes, uh, support indie film and check out Till Death Do Us Parted. It's going to be in AMCs, I know, but some other theaters as well on August 4th. And again, Timothy's all, uh, he's a, he's an, you know, let, like let's keep him in genre stuff because he does Westerns. He does all kinds of films. Like let's just let's just keep him and doing the horror genre stuff because um he's good he's really good at it. He's a great. I'm fine with keeping him in horror. We could do a, we could do a genre mashup movie too. We've got yeah. we've got action and horror. Let's do let's do a horror western next. Yeah, you know what? He'll hear this, and I bet you I, I bet you that will come into fruition someday very soon. 